Well, good evening. good evening. Good to see everyone tonight. We're glad that you are here. We're excited to have Mr. Lee Shelnut with us from Barnabas Ministries um, and also from uh, Spud and Eleanor. Uh, he, he comes from here. So we're glad to have uh, Lee here and we're grateful that you've come. We're going to begin with a word of prayer and we'll just turn it over to you and tell us all about your ministry. And, uh, and we'll just pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to partner in prayer with uh, Lee and his ministry that you have led him in the last uh, few months to, uh, to, to, to partner with, to, to, to organize. And Father, uh, all the things he was telling me he was doing, he's a very busy man. And Father, we pray, God, that you'll continue to bless this ministry, that you'll use it to help uh, lead others and train others to share the gospel around the world. We pray, God, that you'll just give them the workers that they need, uh, the finances that they need, and, Father, your amazing, powerful spirit that they need to accomplish the goals that you have set out for them to do and led them to do and purpose for them to do. Uh, we do thank you so much for the opportunity to hear from him tonight. And we pray, God, that you'll bless him as he shares. Um, in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, we, are, we do have a basket out in the back. As you leave, you can give a love offering tonight. Uh, we want everyone to partner in prayer, and we want you, if you feel led to give, give. Uh, and he will tell us to, to make the checks to, um, or they take cash too. So, yeah. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. If you would, please take your Bibles, and let's begin with God's Word. Let's begin with Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, if you know something about the epistle to the Ephesians, you know that the Apostle Paul is super excited uh, he's exuberant, he's enthralled, he's enthralled with God, he's exuberant about salvation that is found in Jesus Christ, and he's excited, and he's excited particularly about one, one um, I guess something new to his mind, and when, when the Apostle Paul was converted on the Damascus Road, I'm sure that he thought, okay, the Lord is bringing people like me, ethnic Jews, to faith in Jesus as the Messiah. And that's wonderful. And I want my fellow Jews to come to true saving faith in Jesus Christ. But he wasn't anticipating that God was not only going to be bringing ethnic Jews to believe in Jesus as the Messiah, he was going to be bringing what? Gentiles as well. And that's blown the apostle's mind. And so in the first three chapters, he's really going through uh, great doctrines, uh, the salvation that is ours in Jesus Christ, that our salvation is by God's grace alone, and that God is building his church made up of Jews and Gentiles. And we come down to the very last couple of verses in chapter 3, and we find this beautiful doxology. This is the way the apostle Paul, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, concludes the first half of his epistle. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. He's super excited about this glorious work that the Lord is doing, far more than he had expected that he had asked for, that he had thought of. And I love this verse because it reminds me of what the Lord has done in my life. Um, my, uh, there's something wonderful about this evening, about this opportunity that Anthony afforded to me, so thank you, brother, uh, to be here at East Newton Baptist Church. Because in the old building, I remember watching missionaries set up their, turn, their carousel, slide carousel, and they would go through those mission presentations. And it was during those days that I began to have a heart for missions. But I didn't ever expect at that point, and really didn't expect it all the way up through uh, about halfway into my college time, that I would first become a minister, but then become a missionary and have these wonderful opportunities that are before me. I didn't ever think that. I asked that the Lord would just give me grace to be a good Christian, to be, uh, to be faithful to my church, to be in the pew, to give my tithes and offerings, and to, to bless me and my family. I had no idea I would be here at East Newton Baptist Church being able to tell you about the wonderful opportunities in the world. So let me introduce you to the Barnabas ministry. It is a discipleship 
ministry that focuses on discipleship. And uh, let me ask you, in the Great Commission, uh, are we told to go convert the nations? Or are we told to go disciple the nations? Disciple. Now, discipling the nations also includes going out and evangelizing, sharing the gospel, seeking to bring people to Jesus Christ. But it doesn't stop there. So, so missions should always include discipleship. So the Barnabas ministry is a discipleship ministry and support ministry of world witness. That's the agency I am with. Next slide, please. It is an encouraging and a training and a mentoring uh, ministry to international pastors and present and future church leaders. That's the major bulk of my particular work. I've got one other aspect to my work, and that is to be a resource for many of our European missionaries on the field. Next slide, please. Uh, the way it began was about 12, 13, maybe even 14 years ago now. Uh, I was pastoring uh, the Westminster uh, ARP Church in Albemarle, North Carolina, and I had a little bit of time that I could invest in something. So I decided I would go and see if our mission agency needed anybody to help them. So I began to work with this young man, Zeshan Sadiq. Next slide. I went down to World Witness Headquarters, which is in Greenville, South Carolina, and I went to this fellow who was the, exec <coughs> excuse me, the executive director of World Witness at the time. He's Frank Van Dalen. He's a wonderful man. He's from New Zealand, got a wonderful accent, just a vibrant man. He spent 10 years in Pakistan, helped establish a bunch of churches in Karachi. Then he came back to the United States to head up World Witness. Now he's in Lithuania. And he's helping an old reformed denomination there in Lithuania trying to breathe new life into them. And I have the wonderful privilege of going and preaching for him in a couple of weeks. But I went down and I talked to Frank and I said, Frank, is there anything I can do for you? And I came into his office at about the time he was going through his emails. And when Frank was a missionary in Karachi in Pakistan, one of his greatest gifts was coming alongside of young men and helping them and training them and encouraging them as they were moving towards becoming ministers or they were already ministers. And so when he came to the United States, back to the United States, he still had so many of these Pakistani ministers calling on him. Hey, can you help me? Can you help me do this? What should I do in this situation? What should I do in that? And so when I walk into his office, he's going through a bunch of emails from Pakistani brothers. And I say, is there anything I can do to help you? And he says, yes, I got just the thing for you. You can help me with some of these Pakistani pastors, and particularly with this young man by the name of Zeeshan Sadiq. He said, I want us to try to guide him through a Western theological education. He said, he's got a Pakistani theological education, but that's not necessarily a really good one. So let's walk him through and be a mentor to him and be a help to him. Because what we want is not only a man who's got good head knowledge, but we want a man who has a heart for God, a heart for God's people, a heart for God's word, who is a spiritual leader. And so thank you, Anthony. So we began to work with Zeeshan. And next slide, please. And now, my dear brother, it's just that. He's got his master's degree from Erskine Theological Seminary. He's working on a THM. If he gets that degree, that will enable him to be a, a seminary professor. Uh, he pastors a vibrant church, the Bethlehem ARP Church in Saiwal. That's in a, a, a state of uh, Pakistan known as the Punjab. Uh, Punjab. And then he's also the secretary of his denomination, and he serves on the board of PAC-7. PAC-7 is a satellite ministry, uh, satellite TV ministry, beaming into Pakistan in the Urdu language. And so he's on the board of that. So the Lord is blessing through Zishan. Next slide, please. So that's the work, that's how the work began as, a as I was a volunteer. Now, what's the work look like as I'm uh, full board with World Witness full time? Next slide. Well, there are three areas of service and opportunity for me. Next, please. If you ask missiologists, and by the way, what's a missiologist? Anybody know? One who studies missions, an expert in missions. If you ask evangelical missiologists in, in the United States in particular this question, what are the three greatest challenges? They're basically going to come back and give you the same three answers. Next slide. Number one, reaching post-Christian secular Europe for Christ. Now pause there for just a moment. 
and recognize that Europe from basically the mid-1700s to at least the mid-1800s to maybe about 1900, that was the driving engine for world missions, financially and people-wise. Europe sent missionaries out. Europe sent the William Careys of the world out. Now, what was the financial and personnel driving engine of world missions is a mission field in need of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The second one that they will mention, and no particular order in these, is reaching the Islamic world for Christ. Whether that's in Islamic countries or reaching Muslims who are refugees and immigrants in other countries. Third, reaching the global south church, aiding the global south church as it is experiencing explosive growth. And it really is, and I'll show you some some details about that in a moment. Next slide. World Witness, the mission agency that I get to serve with, we're there. We're in all three of those areas of great challenge and opportunity. And this is the knucklehead that gets to work in all three. So I'm privileged to be involved in all three of these areas. Next slide. First, I'm privileged to be working alongside of missionaries in post-Christian secular Europe. I seek to encourage and give pastoral care to several missionary families that we have uh, working in countries like Spain. We've got three families there. Countries like the UK, we've got two families there. We've got families in Germany, in France, in Lithuania, and in Poland. And uh, the way this part of my work got started was when I went to Frank Van Dalen earlier as a volunteer, he said, work with Zishan. And about every 18 months, if you can, go visit him. So I went to Pakistan. I said, sure, sign me up. Let's go. And so I went the first time. And let me just tell you, that's not like driving down to Newnan. That's a long way. And I figured it out. Boy, next time I got to do this smarter. How can I do it smarter? Why don't you stop off in Europe for a few days and get acclimated to some of the time change and then go on? Okay, well, what am I going to do in Europe? Well, I guess we can, I could stay and visit some of our missionaries. So I started visiting missionaries. And the first, um, the first missionaries I visited uh, were the couple up in the far right corner, Mark and Natalie Whitty. Mark and Natalie. Mark's from Buffalo. Uh, Natalie is from uh, Ukraine. And they had just landed in Spain, and they are wrestling with Spanish bureaucracy and the language and living out of boxes and trying to figure out this and that. And Mark was about to pull out his hair. And I land, and I knew Mark was being wound real tight. I said, Mark, just forget about that for a couple of days. Let's just go explore some of Spain. And so we spent time together going to various places. And you could just see the tension level come down. Because he was able to talk some, to somebody in his own language, somebody who was asking him about his spiritual condition, what's going on with you, how can I help you, how can I pray for you. And I just saw the great value in that. We invest so much money in sending missionaries to live on the mission field. And when we send them there, they are facing cultural hurdles, they're having to learn typically language, and I, it's my belief that they're probably facing greater spiritual warfare than we ever know. We know it, but I think they're facing even more. And so we need to encourage them. So I have the wonderful privilege of doing that. The couple in the bottom uh, corner, uh, they were from the church I pastored in Huntersville, and they are now serving in Gloucester, England. Next slide, please. But my main work is particularly in two fields, uh, and I've gone to describing the first one as Pakistani Urdu-speaking world uh, because there are many Pakistanis that are dispersed in other countries now. They go particularly to a lot of the Arab emirate countries and serve as workers. They're kind of the working class. And so they're Pakistanis throughout the emirates and particularly, of course, in Pakistan, but also in the UK. So one area of emphasis is uh, Pakistani, Urdu-speaking world, and the other is East Africa. Next slide, please. Pakistan in the Urdu-speaking world. This this is not a photograph from uh, 100 years ago. That's a photograph from about four months ago, I think, uh, harvesting wheat the old-fashioned way. Next slide, please. Opportunity, uh, Pakistan. Next, please. Uh, Pakistan, and I say remember because hopefully you know this, Pakistan, for any Christian ministry, is an amazingly strategic place 
Next slide, please. And this is one. I don't know if you would have guessed this. It's the fifth largest country in the world by population. Fifth largest. Estimates are it's going to be number four within 10 years. It has over 242 million souls living in it. It's the second largest Muslim country in the world. Anybody know what the first largest or the largest is? Close. Indonesia. Indonesia and then Pakistan. And of those 242 million, 96% of them are Muslim. And World Witness has been in Pakistan since 1906. And we haven't been booted out. We were in Pakistan before there was a Pakistan. Because in 1906, it was a part of India. It was a part of a British colony. And we've been there, and we've got a, a hospital, which is a wonderful ministry in a Muslim world. It's probably one of the best rated hospitals in all of Pakistan. We have a nursing school that offers and teaches a bachelor's degree in nursing. Our nursing students graduate in the top three of uh, nursing schools in all the country, and they are highly sought after. We've got a couple of schools for children, and now we've got this new program of pastoral training. Next slide, please. Barnabas Ministry now is, is getting going uh, there in Pakistan. Uh, I am working, continuing to work with Zishan. I'm looking for the next Zishans because we could use several, um, we, could, we, we desire that the Lord will raise up several young Pakistanis to be good leaders in their denomination and in their Christian community. And so we're developing this leadership pastoral training program, and I'm recruiting teachers for it. Next slide, please. Our conference training program is a, what we would call a modular conference training setup. Uh, we go in and do intensive courses for one and two weeks. And at the end of that, we'll give them a test. And then in between the times we are in country, we'll follow up with them through electronic means. And we're hoping to be able to get into Pakistan three to four times a year. You never quite know whether you're going to get a visa to get into the country. But so far, the Lord's giving us favor, and we're grateful for that. We're aiming at pastors. We're aiming at church leaders, elders, deacons, future church leaders. And we're really aiming at the next generation. Next slide. And we've launched our program. We did this in November. Uh, that's in one of the city streets of Siwal. Siwal is a city of about 600,000 people. And do you see what's being pulled there? A cart being pulled by a what? Donkey. That's Pakistan. You'll see donkey carts. You'll see motorcycles. You'll see lorries and cars. And they're all together. Next slide, please. We began with a one-day conference aimed at uh, not only pastors and church leaders, but for the general Christian uh, public there in Siwal. We had about uh, 100 people there. We were thrilled with that. That was a great beginning. That's what we're hoping to be able to do. We hope to come in and teach a course, then summarize that course in a one-day conference for the general public. And so we were blessed with that. Next slide, please. And we did a three-day sample course with some 40 pastors and theological students. And I think we'll be able to continue working with that group of 40. Next slide. While we were there, we were doing our conference, we were doing our training on the grounds of our hospital. They have a good conference room that seats around 300, 300 to 400 people. Uh, but while we were there, we also assisted the spiritual services department of the hospital, going on rounds with the chaplains, uh, going to see patients. And the majority of patients in the hospital are Muslim. And by law in Pakistan, you cannot publicly share your faith in Jesus Christ. It's illegal. But if a Muslim comes into your home, if a Muslim comes into your school, if a Muslim comes into your church, if a Muslim comes into your hospital, you are free to share the gospel. And so that's one way we are able to minister to these Muslims. And uh, I was on rounds with one of our chaplains, uh, Noble, and we go into a room, and it's an elderly Muslim man and his grandson there. And in each of the wards, we have track racks for them to be able to read tracks in, uh, in, in their uh, quiet times. And we go up there, and, the, uh, and, and Noble said to the young man, would you please take some tracks? May I give you some? And he said, no, 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 no. And uh, so he said, okay, that's fine. 
And then the old man who was being treated, he came around, got off the side of his bed, came over and said, I want to thank you. I've been healed here, and I've been healed in the name of Jesus. And that's the wonderful opportunities that we have. And so we also have the opportunity of pouring into our chaplains and encouraging them. Next slide, please. We also sought to encourage our school teachers. Uh, we do have, like I said, a couple of schools in Pakistan. That's the group of teachers at one of our schools, and that's some of the precious children. Next slide. Um, I've got a former professor. I love his quote. His, name, his name's Richard Pratt. Richard Pratt says, Every Christian deserves a well-trained pastor. Y'all have got a well-trained pastor. You're blessed. Okay? You're, uh, I hate to use this word, but it's appropriate. You're privileged. You're privileged. Not all Christians are. Um, many of these children, these precious Christian children, don't have well-trained pastors. And by God's grace, we're seeking to train those pastors for those children. Amen? Amen? Next slide, please. And we also have one ex uh, unexpected blessing. We're doing the tour, as you, all, as you do when you go to Pakistan and visit our hospital. The administrator will take you through, show you everything. And we had this one lady who said, please bring the Westerners to my department. And so we come in, and she's all bubbly, and she's just excited showing us she's a dentist. And she's got a dentist practice in our hospital. And she's so excited, and she's wanting to show us everything. She says, and, and, and afterwards, I, I, I want to meet with all of you. I've got gifts for you. And we're thinking, this is strange. Okay. So later on that day, we met with her in the conference room of the hospital, the boardroom of the hospital, and she gives us clothes, men's outfits, Pakistani outfits, uh, we had a, a lady with one of our uh, brothers who was with us. Uh, she gave uh, her a Pakistani outfit. And she then began to tell us her story. I'm not going to give you her real name. Uh, her name. I'll call her Kay. Kay was a Muslim. I say was. I don't believe she is now. This is what happened. Kay's husband messed around on her. Kay's husband beat her. Kay and her husband got a divorce. And you think, from your Western perspective, from your Christian perspective, she's the victim, and she was. But her parents didn't see it like that. What happened was, if you get a divorce, what happens, if you get a divorce, you shame your family. And her family, they were shamed by her being divorced. So they sent goons after her to beat her up. Her story made it to the t local television station. She showed me uh, a closed-circuit security video of what happened. She's going to the police station. She gets to the door. As she gets to the door, thugs come in after her, pushing her into the waiting room at the local police department, and they began to beat her up. They break her arm. And with the other hand, she reaches down, she gets her shoe, she takes it off, and she starts flailing at them beating them back, which was a shaming act. The police finally stepped in and stopped it. And after that, she knew, my family has disowned me. What do I do? And she thought, I'll go to the place I was born. You know where she was born? Christian Hospital in Sayawal, Pakistan, our hospital. She goes there, and the administrator says, you're a dentist? Yes. Why don't you set up practice here? And gave her space to start a dental practice. And she wanted to tell all of us from the West, thank you. Thank you for what you have done. My family disowned me. You've received me. Thank you for what you've done. So I think the Lord is at work in her heart. She's not a Muslim now. And I'm praying she'll soon be a Christian. So pray for Kay. And that's the sort of blessings we have. And we've got the opportunity to minister not only to our pastors and church leaders, but to people like Kay. Because those Muslim background believers, it's so dangerous for them and so hard for them to go to a Christian church. And so they, they really need help. And we may have an opportunity to help them. Next slide. We're also going to start up a cohort, uh, Lord willing, in Karachi, which is the largest city in uh, Pakistan, 20 million. To give you an idea, that's about the size of New York City. 
Okay? And uh, I will be, zoom, Lord willing, zooming in on Thursday night. It's either, I have to make sure I get my time thing uh, correctly. About midnight to introduce our program to a group of men gathered there. And we've got a Pakistani, um, he's, a, he's a professor, and he's a good friend. His name uh, is uh, Elia Massey, and he's going to do a, a conference for us on the Reformation there. Next slide. And at the end of March, we're going back in a couple of weeks. I'll be heading out for Pakistan to do our first full training with my partner, uh, Sam Cotton, who's one of our main teachers. Next slide. But it's the third opportunity that really gets me excited, and that's helping our Global South Church as it's experiencing explosive growth. Next slide, please. Particularly in Sub-Sahara Africa, uh, and particularly in East Africa. Next slide. I want you to take in these two statistics because they are extraordinary to me. It is estimated that by the year 2060, four out of every 10 Christians will live in sub-Saharan Africa. 40% of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ will be African. Notice the bottom statistic. It is estimated in the next 40 years, the church in Africa will grow not by 750,000. Do the math for me. What is that? 750 million new Christians. Praise be to the Lord. Now those new Christians are going to need what? Churches. And those churches are going to need what? Pastors. Next slide, please. Now think about that. That's what's happening in the global south, and that's what's happening in Africa, what's happening in the United States. Not here, because the Lord's hand of blessing is upon the ministry here. We thank the Lord for that. But in so many other churches, what's happening? They're being emptied out, right? Are we experiencing explosive growth in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in the United States? No. We're shrinking. We're being winnowed. And while that's happening to us, what's happening to the church in places like Africa is exploding. Next slide. So as the church in the West faces increasing opposition and winnowing, the church in Africa is going to become all the more important and strategic in the advance of the Great Commission and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Next slide. I've got a good missionary friend by the name of Frank Sindler. He's a veteran of uh, service in, in both West Africa and now in East Africa. Frank's got this wonderful statement. I pray it's a hyperbole. But if, even if it is, there's a great grain of truth in it. Frank says, our grandchildren are going to need African missionaries to share the gospel with them. But the question is, what gospel will they share? Our daughter, is uh, she's on staff at a church in Manhattan. She does administrative assistance work there. And on staff, they already have a Nigerian pastor because New York City already needs African missionaries. Atlanta's going to need and probably needs even now African missionaries. We're going to need them. But what will they be bringing? What will they be saying? We've got an opportunity to pour ourselves into them now and preparing them to be faithful missionaries in the future. Next slide. East Africa, especially the country of Rwanda, it's a wonderful opportunity for us in the global south. Next slide, please. I call this opportunity Rwanda. It's the training of thousands of pastors, and that's not going to be hyperbole. Next slide. But why we're a witness in this particular little country? It's about the size of Maryland. Okay, that gives you a, a, an idea. You probably had never heard of it before 1994, right? Uh, why we're a witness in Rwanda? Next slide, please. It's a pretty complicated story. I break it down into six chunks. I'll try to be quick with these. Uh, it, there's the genocide of 94, a particular survivor, his future ministry, his thinking, his spiritual thinking from child to home to church to pastor, his partnership with American churches, and a benevolent president and government. Next slide, please. Go back to 1994 with me, and I don't think we've got any young ones in here, so I can be a little bit more explicit. Uh, I think we're all old enough to remember this. We started hearing terrible news coming out of this country, of Rwanda, and the news was of a genocide. 
Now, there had been a lot had gone into uh, leading up to that genocide. But the, the final uh, match that was lit and thrown on, uh, on the, the wood was the downing of an airplane that included the president of Rwanda and the president of Burundi. And when that airplane crashed, killing both of those men, almost immediately, a message went out by radio. That was a trigger message. And it unleashed thousands of French-trained young radical Hutus with machetes in hand, and they began going through the countryside, mutilating, killing, hacking to death, million, the estimates of million to 12, uh, 1.2 million, fellow countrymen, moderate Hutus, and the opposing tribe, the Tutsis. Within a hundred days, a tenth of the population is dead. Bodies strewn across the beautiful countryside. And it's a beautiful country. It's known as the land of a thousand hills and it's absolutely gorgeous. But it ran red. And just, just imagine that for a moment. Next slide. Next slide. There was one survivor, we're grateful for that there were many, but there's one that's important and dear to me. His name is Benjamin. Benjamin Musayuki. Next slide. Um, let me fill in some of the details of his story. He's a 12-year-old boy, loved his grandparents, went to go visit his grandparents. They lived in a hut. Um, once he gets there to visit his grandparents in this small hut home, the grandparents soon hear a bunch of noise, and they knew what it meant. They knew that the genociders were coming. And so they said, Benjamin, get up into the rafters of our hut home, hide, don't make a sound. Don't say anything. And sure enough, the genociders come in, and right below Benjamin, 12-year-old Benjamin, they hack his grandfather and grandmother to death. Miraculously, he didn't make a no noise, a sound. Hours later, after they've gone, they're continuing their mayhem. Hours later, he slides down, goes past his grandparents one more time, and he was on the run for the remainder of those 100 days of terror. At the end of those 100 days of terror, he's found by missionaries in Kigali. These missionaries take him in. They care for him, and that care ended up uh, taking him all the way through college. And at the end of his college time, he says, I, I sense that the Lord is calling me into ministry. Uh, and so he began to try to find as many addresses to as many American seminaries as he could, and he begins to fire off letters and send them, would you please take me as a student? Nobody responded to him. No school that he sent his letters to responded to him except one. And in the providence of God, that just happened to be the seminary of my denomination. And the dean of the seminary, Dean Rubel at the time, said, Benjamin, come on, we'll take you, and we'll give you an education. So imagine this. Benjamin, the survivor of the genocide, goes to Dew West, South Carolina. And do you even know where Dew West, South Carolina is? It's due west of nowhere. It is out in the country. Can you imagine the culture shock? But this school and the community and the local church, they just embraced him. They loved on him, and he got his education. And he networked with all kinds of Baptists and, uh, and Presbyterian and ARP churches while he was there. Next slide. And after receiving his education, this is what he did. It's miraculous. He went home. Now, why is that miraculous? If you know much about third world country folks who come to the United States for an education, what do they do once they get it? They stay. They don't go back. He went back. Why? Because he had a heart. Next slide. He had a heart for orphaned children and poor children like he had been. Next slide, please. And so he begins this, what's become this wonderful ministry called Reach the Children of Rhonda International, RCRI. That's a child sponsorship program, and they are caring for 1,000 children, praise be to the Lord, through child sponsorship. Um, it's, if you're familiar with Compassion International or World Vision, it's sort of like a mom-and-pop version of that. And so for $30 a month, you can assist and help sponsor a child. Next slide. 
then uh, he expanded that ministry from his home. He just bought a home in Kigali, opened it up to the street urchins, and that's where the ministry began. It expands out across the country. Had a, they were starting to notice that they had a bunch of poor children roaming the streets in Kigali from a certain area, which then told him that area was facing all kinds of problems. So he goes to that area and he starts a school. And now there's a school there that educates, I think, uh, next slide, I may have these, yeah. The number was 300 children when I first made that slide, it's now up to 400 children. And, and they are sponsored and they receive a quality Christian education, school uniforms, insurance required by the law for the, them and their family, some meals and other needs as able. Next slide. So that gets this genocide survivor Erskine ministry to children. Now, how do we get to pastors? Next slide. How do you go from a child sponsorship program to a pastoral training one? Next slide. By having a heart for children, a heart that's open to the needs of the students you're trying to reach. Now, if I asked y'all, have you ever had a really good teacher? You could probably all raise your hand. And I can raise my hand. I had Miss Morris. She was a really good Sunday school teacher. I still remember those animal crackers wrapped in wax paper. But she loved us. Good teachers love students, right? And when a, when a teacher loves students, and when those students come into the classroom, they're bringing uh, with them not only their bodies, but they're bringing with them the problems from home. And so these children come in with problems, and he begins to think, how can we help these children and their problems? He says, okay, we're going to go on home visitations. So he and all of his teachers go on regular home visitations. So they go in to visit the homes uh, to, of these children. If, and if you ever go on a short-term uh, trip there, he'll take you on home visitations. And that's a wonderful ministry. And as soon as you start going down the volcanic road, you know, then you're going to have a bunch of little kids following you. Mzungu, 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 which means whitey. Or it means foreigner. And it's just, it's precious. Uh, but he, he went to the homes and he saw the needs there in the home. Next slide. And he asked, who can help us with those needs? He turns to the local churches. He goes to the local churches. Next slide, please. And he recognizes uh, and he better understands the pastors in these churches need training that they might preach God's word well, teach God's word well, shepherd God's people well. And so, next slide. He turns uh, to, back to his network of Baptists and ARP churches and other churches. Said, Will you help me sponsor children? And then, next slide. He turns to World Witness and he says, Will you help me train the pastors? And that's how we got started in Rhonda. Next slide. So that gets us to a partnership with American churches. One more block, a benevolent president and government. Next slide. Think with me about potential uh, trouble spots in this beautiful country of the land of a thousand hills now in 2023. One, uh, you've got the issue of you still have Hutus and Tutsis. Now, don't think of two tribes living in totally different areas. They're all intermingled. They live right beside one another. They go to church with one another. They sit on the same pews. Now, if you see a, a Rondon who's about 28 years old or older, they went through the genocide. And if they were Hutus, that means they're dealing with a measure of guilt. Whether they wielded the machete or not, they still have guilt. And if it's a Tutsi, they're dealing with grief and maybe sometimes bitterness. And so you've got that as a potential hot spot again. You've got prosperity gospels, peddlers, uh, one of the terrible things that we export into the world. Western prosperity gospels. If you would just have enough faith and give me enough money, then all your problems go away. And those prosperity gospel peddlers prey on the poor. And then you've got the issue of syncretism. That's the blending together of the Christian faith or a version of the Christian faith with beliefs and uh, other, other religious beliefs. And then also the problem about uh, Islam, the rise of Islam with a lot of Islamic money. Qatar, Qatar, they are pouring money into Rwanda. They're building them a brand new international airport. They're doing that for future favor. And so there's also going to be the rise of Islam in sub-Saharan Africa. That leads us to a ruler, 
uh, a president and his government. That's Paul Kagame. Paul Kagame uh, was a Tut- is a Tutsi. His family experienced trial runs of the genocide. They fled into Uganda when he was a kid. He, uh, he was a child prodigy. They soon figure it out. He rises in the ranks of the Uganda military. He's trained at the U.S. War College in, uh, in the United States. Uh, he goes back. When the genocide began, he led the Rwandan Patriotic Force and eventually put down the genocide. Shortly thereafter, he becomes the vice president. Now he's the president. And as president, Paul Kagame wants Rwanda, Rwanda to be the Singapore of Africa. Now that means, if you know anything about Singapore, that means it's going to be a prosperous country. It's not going to be indebted to the world. It's going to be a safe country. It's going to be a clean country. And it is going to be heavily controlled by the government. And that's what he's wanting for Rwanda. And it's becoming that. Next slide. It's becoming just that. Next slide. Um, that's a street in the capital of Kigali. Look how clean that is. They have a monthly national holiday. Every, I believe it's third Saturday of the month. Everybody has to give several hours on a Saturday morning to community service. And then after community service, you gather together with your local group, and the government gives you any of the information that they need you to have. And if you've been having problems with your neighbor... You are expected to work it out right there. (laughs) And don't let it linger. Uh, Next slide, please. Now, what may hinder that ongoing progress? Anything that can refuel that tribal animosity. Charismatic, and by that I mean people with big personalities, coming in, using a religious platform to gain a following, and then cause uh, instability in the country. Any strife that could flare up between Christians and Muslims and poor standards of living. Next slide. So the government decides it's going to institute a law. By 2023, all pastors must have an education from an accredited, recognized undergraduate. We're hoping um, they're a little flexible on that institution to remain as pastors. We are in year 2023. So what's the repercussions? It means that if the government is firm with the implementation of this law, thousands of pastors are going to be out of a job and their church is closed indefinitely. Next slide, please. So what's the repercussion of that for us? We've got thousands of pastors and churches, and I'm not, this is not hyperbole, reaching out for help. And many of them are reaching out to us. Next slide, please. And by God's grace, we are at work. Uh, We've presently got three cohorts of students. That's about 100 students. Each of our cohorts are around 30 to 33 in number. Uh, And we've got another three uh, in waiting that we just just don't have enough resources to to teach them at this time. Next slide. We're taking them through a two-year program. Uh, Each cohort will take 10 courses delivered over 16 weeks. That will take them through a two-year program. And at the end of that, we are praying they get a global diploma in uh, theology and Christian leadership. Next slide, please. We are also beginning a conference ministry there. We started our first one. Many of the pastors are saying, "What's, what's Islam? We don't know anything about it. We keep seeing these mosques pop up. And so they asked us, and so we did a training for them, a conference for them, what is Islam and how to reach out to Muslims. And we had about 75, maybe closer to 80 pastors and church leaders for that. And here's what was really encouraging. We had another group of about 60 to 65 Muslim background believers. These are Muslims who've been converted, and they have come to Christ, and they need encouragement. And so we've got an opportunity to reach them as well. Next slide. How can East Noonan help? How can you help? Uh, next slide, please. By being Barnabases. <laughs> I don't know if that's the right way to say it. By being a Barnabas. What does Barnabas mean? Son of encouragement. Son of encouragement. By being encouragers. Encourage us as you have this evening already talking to so many of you. You give me the wonderful privilege of being here. Encouraging us in the work. Encouraging through prayer and support. Next slide, please. Pray. You know all preachers say that, don't they? You just need to pray. And all missionaries say that. I mean it. We need your prayers. Next slide. I love this Bunyan quote. You can do more than pray after you have prayed, but you cannot do more than pray until you've prayed. 
So please pray for us. Next slide, please. Pray for the Shellnets and particularly these three opportunities, reaching our missionaries, encouraging them, working in Pakistan, working in Rwanda, and that work is going to spread into the uh, other African countries. Next slide, please. And also through support, support through knowledge, uh, support through service, and of course, uh, financial support. Next slide. Knowledge. Uh, and it's okay, uh, although we're in the sanctuary, it's a Wednesday night, this is not a sermon. You can get out your phone right now. You know, if you've got a phone, and if you've got one of those email apps, you can send an email to me right now to leeS at worldwitness.org. And you can just say, add me. And you can give me your address, your mailing address too, if you'd like to. And I'll put you on our email distribution list and I'll put you on our mailing list if you give me your address. So you're welcome to do that. Um, you can also, if you're a Facebooker, you can uh, join my uh, private Facebook group for the ministry. Not everybody likes to say I'm on Facebook, but if you are on Facebook and you want to uh, send me a friend request, if we're not already friends, I'll send you an invitation to join my uh, private page. I try to give like weekly updates there, so you'll get a lot more information rather than kind of quarterly newsletters. But uh, either way, it's fine with me. You can also serve. I was talking to Anthony. He said, yeah, I'd just love to get y'all to come. We'll come on a short-term trip to, to Africa. And we take, you to, we take you to that school. Uh, we, we sent, when I say we this time, I'm talking about my last church that I pastored, the Huntersville ARP Church. We, we sent about four of our folks to help out this other church uh, with a team. They had about six, I think, six folks. So a group of 10, they go over there. Some of the men, they're doing construction projects on things there at the school. And the ladies and one of the guys doing recreation, they do a vacation Bible school. Now, how many, how many people do you typically need for your staff to do a vacation Bible school here in the United States? What, what if you got 400 kids? You need about, you, we, we have six. Six did a vacation Bible school for 400 kids. Each class was 100 students full. And they are well behaved. That's just the way they are. They are so well behaved. So we had our workers and some translators and we're able to do it. So don't be intimidated. You can do it. And if you want to send a group, we'd love to have you. And I'd take you around and, and, and uh, hold your hand a little bit. Next slide, please. And financial support. Thank you for the opportunity. There is a basket back there. If you are writing a check, you're welcome to write it to World Witness. And then on the four line, uh, the memo line, you can, if you'd like to support the Shellnuts in helping us uh, do this work to oversee the Barnabas ministry in these two countries, you could just say Shellnut, Shellnut support. Uh, if you'd like to help, particularly in Pakistan, if that has pricked your heart, the Lord has uh, worked in your heart, say yes. Then you could say Barnabas, Pakistan. If the Lord's pricked your heart about Africa, you could say Barnabas, Rhonda. Any one of those three options would be fabulous. So grateful for that. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm grateful for, again, this opportunity for your prayers and for the way the Lord might work in your hearts and our hearts together to partner uh, in this great task of the Great Commission, and particularly the Great Commission working it out in Pakistan and in Africa. Next slide, please. Uh, let me end just with uh, to bring you back to statistics. I guess uh, being a Georgia Tech graduate, I you know, kind of like numbers every once in a while. Uh, I don't know if you can see this, but in the year 1910, 1.4% 1 of the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ lived in Sub-Saharan Africa. 1.4%. Go 100 years, 2010, that percentage was 23.6% of the church's population. Quiz time, in another 50 years from 2010, 2060, what's the percentage going to be? 40%. Next slide, please. 40%. Next slide. The decline of the church in the West is being offset by the growth of the church in places like Rwanda. In many ways, you're looking at the future of the Christian church. When you look at that beautiful young lady, if you go back to that slide, I, I, I have to linger there just a moment. When you look at that beautiful young girl, you're looking at the future of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you had asked missiologists about 50 years ago, what does the average Christian, world Christian, look like? 
they would have said probably a, a, a Caucasian male in their 30s. You ask missiologists, what does the average Christian in the world look like today? It's a dark skinned girl in about her, her early 20s. In 2060, when you ask that, that's what the average Christian is going to look like. It's amazing. Next slide. Help her, and you can help her through RCRI, and I'd be happy to give you information about RCRI and help us train her pastor. Because every Christian deserves what? A well-trained pastor. And we want those well-trained pastors to minister to Christians in Rwanda and Pakistan and soon lead a great missionary force to come here and to go to Europe. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for this amazing privilege that you have given to me to be back home and to be back at East Noonan, to have an opportunity to share what you are doing in the world. You have promised that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so while things can look bleak here in the United States, and particularly as we watch the news and consider the state of the church, your church is actually growing by leaps and bounds by the moving of your spirit in other places. Now we ask, Lord, that you would use people like us to come alongside of brothers and sisters in the world to be encouragers to them and helps to them that the gospel may be proclaimed, that it may be lived out faithfully, and that the Great Commission will continue to be fulfilled in each succeeding generation by your church. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Anthony.